Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Troy, for, for having us all. And we're, you're gonna, you are going to meet some amazing people shortly. Um, so I'm Eric John. I, uh, I manage IAB's Video Center of Excellence. And for folks who are perhaps not in the media space, a little bit about what IAB is and does, we are kind of like the big tent <coughs> under which buyers, media buyers and sellers come to figure out how to make the marketplace more efficient to address things like standards and, and uh, protocols to basically serve advertising into the whole ecosystem of media as it's, as it's evolving. Um, everyone knows the drumbeat around brand safety has been growing, and with good reason. According to a study by Digiday, 75% of brands reported at least one brand safety exposure issue in the past year. Roughly 45% have been using brand safety solutions, uh, and 15% don't use any at all. Three or four years ago, brand safety was, I would say, really not a front burner issue. Back then, problematic content like drugs, sex, and alcohol were managed with do not run lists and keyword avoidance. Remember those good old days? <laughs> um, but fast forward to today, and the digital environment is a lot more complicated. The newest hot buttons of brand safety include non-human traffic, fake news, as we've all been seeing, uh, user-generated outrage, and data breaches, and of course, divisive content on social media. Brand safety took a whole new level of urgency as Keith Weed uh, from Unilever pointed out at the IAB annual leadership meeting in January that brand safety debate has now become a consumer issue and that platforms must take ownership of their role in the, distribu in the distribution of divisive content. That was followed by Mark Zuckerberg's, uh, Zuckerberg's testimony in April before Congress where he was questioned about Facebook's role in the 2016 presidential elections, as well as how Facebook handles data, et cetera. On the question of whether he sees Facebook as tech platform or publisher, he said, my understanding at the heart of what you're asking is, do we feel responsibility for the content on our platform? The answer to that, I think, is clearly yes. So it's clear we're all on notice from Washington to our next door neighbor. But the good news is there are many industry-wide efforts underway to address various parts of the brand safety conundrum. IAB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, has always stood for greater transparency and disclosure in the digital advertising supply chain, regardless of whether the ads are political or commercial, because ultimately transparency and disclosure are core to consumer safety and brand safety, as you'll hear shortly. So in order to help resolve ad fraud issues like domain spoofing, IAB Tech Lab, our sister organization, launched ads.txt, a publicly accessible record of authorized digital sellers for inventory. This gets to that supply chain and, and basically shining a light on buyers and sellers and who the right sellers are. We'll be discussing this and some more future-leaning technologies like blockchain in our panel shortly. But first, here to outline some of what they're doing today is Rachel Nicewender Thomas, Senior Vice President, Operations and Policy at IAB's sister organization, Trustworthy, Accountab Trustworthy Accountability Group, otherwise known as TAG. She's going to share an update on their efforts at TAG and how they serve as a forum for the industry to fight fraud, piracy, malware, and more. Rachel? Sure. Uh, I'm the SVP of Operations and Public Policy at what we call TAG. The Trustworthy Accountability Group is a little bit too much of a mouthpiece or a mouth, uh, mouthful, um, and I am the mouthpiece of the mouthful. So <laughs> let's set the stage a little bit first around where we are as an industry on brand safety uh, today and what we mean by brand safety. This is how many of you are thinking about brand safety in the course of your day? How many of you feel like you have a well-defined understanding of what you even mean by brand safety? I, that, that looks about right. Okay. And, that's, and you're not alone because I think one of the big problems at the moment or, or one of the big challenges is we all are talking about brand safety. It's one of the biggest buzzwords in this industry right now. But when we, when we seek to actually define what we're talking about here, it's a little bit of a unicorn. Right? Um, when we are talking about brand safety, getting your arms around what you mean by that and what we as an industry, I, sh I would say, need to mean by that is it's, uh, it's fairly elusive. And so TAG has been not only doing our day jobs in thinking about how to stop crime in this industry, but also trying to sort of facilitate the industry in, in figuring out exactly how we should be defining brand safety and uh, figuring out all of the components of that and then, of course, how best to go about ensuring it in all of these different areas. 
So we've doing that, been doing that by searching the bounds of the interwebs for how people are talking about brand safety, going to many conferences and, and looking across agendas at who is framing it in what different ways. And we've also been undertaking a whole series of interviews with our members at TAG, the leaders in this industry more broadly, uh, to understand, again, how folks are thinking about this as well as what they're doing about it. So, Eric, you mentioned three or maybe four things that folks think of as brand safety today, but what we're seeing is a little bit of a, a, little bit of a broader list. It's actually quite, quite a long list. The responses that we're getting are many and varied when we think about uh, what we mean by brand safety as individual companies or sectors of the industry or, or digital advertising as a whole. Um, it's everything from all of this is brand safety to folks who have much more limited and defined definitions. Um, you know, we've talked to some companies who think of brand safety very specifically as ensuring uh, that your ads don't appear in a context that could be reputationally concerning for that particular brand. There are other folks who, you know, consider things like ad blocking and latency and data protection not to be included in brand safety and others who think that that's absolutely fundamental to it. There are some who have very, uh, very defined frameworks for how they think about this in terms of not just what is included in brand safety, but how you address these issues and looking at it from a three-part perspective of, or three filters of reputational risk and financial risk and legal risk. And so again, not just knowing that it's important, but actually sort of characterizing, categorizing how you go about solving these issues based on those three sorts of filters. And of course, perhaps unsurprisingly, one of the biggest variations in how people are talking about brand safety in this issue depends on where they sit in the supply chain, right? We've got ad, uh, I think, adjacency up here. Well, when you say adjacency to an advertiser, to a, to a buyer, an agency, Adjacency is all about making sure that your ads don't show up next to very problematic content. But in talking to publishers, of course, adjacency means making sure that there isn't an ISIS ad that happens to show up next to your premium content. So I think it's important for us to keep in mind that this very large and, and broad and an important area in which we are all concerned and working uh, varies significantly depending on where we're all sitting and, and what perspective we're bringing to the table there. The good news is we're all working very hard on it. Um, and as an industry, I've, I've been in this industry for a long time. TAG is not the first self-regulatory body that I've worked on in this industry. Um, and so I'm quite familiar with exactly how serious this industry is about solving these problems. And we're getting quite good at doing it together at this point. So those are just some of the organizations that this industry either works with or has created in order to address various aspects of brand safety. So you may be familiar, I hope, I hope, with the Ad Choices icon, the Digital Advertising Alliance, one of the more recognizable 10 or, 10 or 12 years in now, um, ways in which consumers have choice. They deal with privacy and the sort of data issues behind digital advertising and give consumers the choice uh, about how they want to be contacted with advertisements in the digital space. Now, TAG, of course, uh, is where I spend my days at this point, and we are focused on the criminal activity that goes on in a legitimate supply chain. So we focus specifically on fraud and piracy and malware and the transparency that's needed to make sure that criminals can't hide in what is an incredibly complicated uh, transactional system that we've created as an industry. So that's where we are, the criminal activity aspect. And then the, the, one of the newer kids on the block is the Coalition for Better Ads ads, which is focused really much more on that ad experience from the consumer perspective. So issues of latency, issues of uh, annoying ads, et cetera, et cetera. So you can sort of get all of these different perspectives that we have to bring to this issue of brand safety. And Eric mentioned the IAB Tech Lab, who's a wonderful partner uh, to those of us on Team TAG uh, in coming up with technical solutions for some of these problems. So Eric mentioned ads.text. I'll also mention the lean principles, which are incredibly important when it comes to that consumer ad experience. Um, and ads.text is incredibly important to us at TAG in our work on fighting fraud. And then the MRC, of course, uh, does a lot of good things that are unrelated to the digital advertising space, but the invalid traffic guidelines that they 
developed and, and keep up underlie uh, TAG's entire program on, on fraud. So also very important in this space. So the good news is, in, in my perspective, uh, in my opinion, we're getting very good at doing these kinds of things together as an industry. And I'm going to now dive a little bit deeper on the part of doing things well together that TAG plays. So TAG's role on brand safety is, uh, well, I'll say everything we do is about brand safety, right? We are focused on the criminal aspects of you know, keeping your brand safe, avoiding the criminal aspects in order to keep your brand safe. Uh, but there isn't anything in our bailiwick that isn't about brand safety. So we have five different programs at TAG. The first is a verification program. We don't work with any companies that we can't have pass our background check. Uh, so that we know that when you look at the tag registry of known companies, these are companies that are the real Disney or the real Procter or the real Group M, so that you can be sure that you aren't working with a, a criminal spoofing a legitimate brand or you know, pretending to be a legitimate supplier in this, in this supply chain. That verification, the Verified by TAG program, is, is the foundation under which all of our certification programs are built. So in, until you are verified by TAG, we will not work with you on certifying any of your business practices. But once you are, we work with you in four different areas. So TAG has certification programs on fraud, piracy, and malware. We have an additional one called the Inventory Quality Guidelines Certification, which is a transparency program to make sure that we have transparency in how we're categorizing both inventory and creative so that there's much better clarity between the buy and sell side about what is actually being transacted. You know, part of our, our uh, philosophy at TAG is we've gotten ourselves into these situations as an industry with this unfortunate criminal activity occurring in the legitimate supply chain because things have gotten so complicated, because there's been a lack of transparency. And so TAG's fourth, and I would say somewhat most important part of our mission, uh, the fourth pillar is increasing business transparency. And that's the one that probably evolves the most over time as new challenges come into our our, uh, our minds as an industry, particularly when it comes to new brand safety challenges. So the way that we work at TAG is really a, a multi-layered and multidisciplinary approach. So our certifications aren't just for vendors or intermediaries or publishers or advertisers. They're for everybody. The problems that we're trying to solve, I would say generally when it comes to brand safety, but particularly in TAG's bailiwick, cannot be solved without engagement, very strong engagement from every single part of that supply chain. So when we, when we design a certification, we do it in a way that has roles to play for every part from advertiser and agency and intermediary and publisher and all of those vendors that might be related across the supply chain. Now that doesn't mean that everybody has the same role to play, of course. So all of these different requirements that you see here apply to those different kinds of business models in different ways. So what makes the certification so powerful, what makes the program so powerful, is that you've got so many different kinds of checks all across the, the transaction, such that when the transaction finishes, it hasn't just been checked once for fraud or filtered once for fraud. There's been preventative actions like ads.txt, the publisher communicating in the first place. This is where you can buy my inventory in a legitimate way, and if you aren't Following that ads.txt file, you're probably buying uh, fraudulent content. And then moving down the supply chain, requiring publishers to disclose if they're buying traffic, right? Because we know that there are higher, level, higher levels of fraud if you're sourcing your traffic in a paid way. And then down into the intermediary space, making sure that at every step in the supply chain, fraud is measured and filtered for particular kinds of threats. And then all the way down again, making sure that you've got this chain of custody through our payment ID system, such that if some fraud does occur, you actually have a possibility of going back and finding where it happened, and not simply having this, this frustrating conversation between the buy and sell side about how to have a, how to have a remediation, how to have a clawback. <coughs> Excuse me. We also are collaborative in our solutions. So the certifications only work if everybody's involved. This, the, the certifications only work if you've got collaboration underlying these programs. So in addition to actually writing 
audit standards for what it means to be certified against fraud or piracy or malware. We also develop, very often with the IAB Tech Lab or others, technical solutions and tools to help companies comply with those standards. That's everything from the tag registry that I mentioned, that sort of white pages for the industry, so that if someone's in the tag registry, you can look them up and see if they're certified in this or that, and in what countries, geographically, et cetera, et cetera. So you know much more about who your partners are. Two things like the data center IP list and pirate mobile app list, which again are tools where the industry pools their own intel in order to create the strongest uh, block lists for data center threats, pirate mobile app threats, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the moment, we are in beta, soon to be general release, for our threat sharing hub, which will be the place where this entire industry can come together to share the malware or malvertising threats that they're seeing, such that we not only can make sure that those attacks are significantly shortened, fewer in, uh, infections in the first place, but also we can track the trends and have a greater likelihood of actually working with our, our dear law enforcement partners uh, in order to catch these criminals and reduce the issues that we're all having coming down the pike in the first place. The really good news is it seems to be working quite well, and here's why. Again, not to sound too redundant, but this isn't just about one partner that you work with getting certified and calling it a day. It's not about making sure that your anti-fraud vendor is certified. It's about making sure that everybody you work with is following these rules and that you're following them yourself. And the reason that that's so important is we've, we've done some research in the past few months that I sort of call the, the Procter and Campbell uh, hypothesis, bearing out the, the P&G hypothesis. They, gosh, almost, a year and a half ago now, uh, at, at ALM, at the IB conference, said, we are only going to work with companies that are tag certified against fraud. The entire supply chain that P&G works with has to be certified against fraud. And so what basically uh, they've, been, they've required is everybody has to do that filtering and that cleaning up and that ads.txt and all of those different um, requirements at every step in that transaction. So our CEO, Mike, is uh, very fond of saying, why would you want single filtered water when you could have triple filtered mm -hmm. water? And that's really exactly what uh, TAG accomplishes. Your inventory, your transaction is being filtered and scanned and corrected so many times down the supply chain that when you are buying through a TAG certified channel, we're seeing 84% reductions in fraud rates against the industry average. So we're getting fraud rates down from you know, 12 or 8% um, to 1.84 percent. But again, only if everybody is, is participating. <clears throat> the even better news is everybody's participating. So this is just in the past year, and the, the numbers have gotten even better since then, I'm delighted to say. Um, we, we did this slide back in December, and you can see just in one year, uh, folks have absolutely just jumped at adoption of this certification. We're seeing more and more companies say uh, in the U.S. and international markets that they'll only work with partners who are certified. Um, and what has resulted is, you know, we've got over 300 companies in the, the white pages, the tag registry at this point. 120 of them have, have uh, pardon me, 80 of them have earned over 120 certification seals between them because many companies aren't just doing fraud. They're recognizing that you actually can't fight fraud without fighting piracy and malware and having good transparency as well. So we're seeing more and more companies do the full suite. We call them our super users uh, with all four certifications. And that means that we've also had um, massive growth internationally as well. So TAG now has more than 130 or 150 companies outside of the U.S. Uh, in about 30 companies, or 30 countries rather. So the adoption is growing and growing and growing, which has been wonderful to see. And that means that we're really making progress as an industry. I mean, some fantastic headlines over the past year in terms of uh, seeing fraud fraud plunge, seeing piracy plunge as well. I didn't speak to the research that we did there, but when folks are certified against piracy, we're seeing 50% and more reductions in the ad revenue that's going to pirates. So that program is also bearing out as a very successful one as well. All right, so that's where we are. So that's a fairly happy, shiny, we're on our way kind of look at things, but there's still plenty more work to be done. So what's next? Here are some things that we're thinking about at TAG at the moment that I, that I hope you'll think about with us. 
defining brand safety, right? I think it's really important that we get our arms around and really define, not just as an industry, but as individual companies, what brand safety is going to mean for each of us. And again, it will be different depending on where you are and what your priorities are and, and how your business runs, and that's okay. What TAG is trying to do is help make sure that you're considering the full scope as you then define. So we are preparing to release a series of white papers over the next few months defining brand safety based on what this industry is talking about and thinking about, and also on the challenges of brand safety and what the best practices are uh, for fighting those challenges, for, for solving, for resolving those issues. We're also starting to see the rise of the brand safety officer, which we think is very exciting, not just because we need more people in our C-suite, but because we need to make sure that there's somebody who's having this kind of filter for what brand safety is and looking out and making sure that it's reflected. Um, I remember my, my background originally is in privacy and data security, and I remember the rise of the chief privacy officer and what a game changer that was in terms of making sure that a company uh, was complying in all different situations and, and the amount of uh, sort of risk and liability that has been cleaned up just by virtue of having a cop on the beat internally, a friendly cop on the beat, to help make sure that things are built right in the first place. And that's exactly what a brand safety officer can do as well, especially in an area that, again, we need to define and also will continue to be elusive in some ways as long as all of us are around. And the reason is, the challenges are going to keep evolving, right? So having that person focused in the company on making sure that brand safety as it's defined today is being taken care of, but also looking down the field at what else is coming, it's gonna be really important. It's not enough, though, to have one person in your company whose day job this is. Um, I have been a person like that in a company, and without the team and the buy-in at all levels in all business units, um, that's just a, a nice chair to sit in by yourself. So I think developing that brand safety mindset throughout companies is going to be equally important. I think having that, that BSO to help lead that charge is important, but making sure that folks are thinking through the concepts of brand safety and kind of having that checklist in the back of their minds as they're going about their days is going to resolve a lot of the, the smaller things that are, that are getting by right now um, if we're all just kind of thinking about this in a structured way. And I'd say that the continued industry collaboration is going to be a huge part of the solution here. Um, I, I would not work in this industry if it wasn't one that I thought was uh, able and willing to collaborate in ways that actually solve problems. It's been an inspiring career to have in this industry to watch. Um, and so I, I highly expect and, and believe that it's possible for us to solve whatever comes down the pike if we continue to have great trade associations like the IAB and the 4As and the ANA taking the lead and creating groups like TAG and the DAA and the CBA, but also just generally having us come together in the transactions of our, our clients and partners and thinking about these issues together. And that's all I've got for you guys. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from the rest of my panelists, and I'll turn it back to Eric. Thanks, Rachel. Well, we do have a super group here to, to help untangle what some of the different uh, issues are and, and what some of the solves are looking and appearing to be. So let me bring up um, our super group. Um, Christiana Kachaputi. Kachaputi. <laughs> She's VP of Partnerships and Platform Ops at Madhive and Executive Director of Ad Ledger. Why don't you come on up? Uh, Rachel Neiswinder Thomas, who you just met uh, from TAG, SVP Ops and Policy. Joe Barone, who we all know in, in the media space, he's managing partner, Brand Safety Americas for Group M. And then Lori Baker, my friend at, uh, at, Discovery, at Discovery Communications, formerly Scripps and uh, just to, Disco Yes, there we go, Discovery Inc. If you don't know, Discovery and Scripps just, uh, just merged, and so it's a big, big world there. And uh, so, good, everyone has a seat. Um, so, Rachel, I think you laid out a, 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 the landscape really well. Um, I just want to ask the room here. So we've got, I was walking around a little bit and, and talking to folks. Um, some are from the tech space, some are from the media space, some, some in the hardware space. It's, it's an interesting mix. But I'm just curious, show of hands, 
regardless of what you do, has your company had a brand safety issue come up in the past year? Raise your hands. And by brand safety, all the things that, that Rachel outlined there. A consumer, I would even, yeah, media folks, obviously. But even if you're a brand, a consumer who is maybe not understanding your product and is potentially disparaging your, your brand in a way that is you know, disconcerting to your CMO, that even falls in within the realm of, of, of brand safety. So um, I want to just start here. Tell us, each of, each, e tell us what each of you does in your company and what are you focused on primarily today in terms of brand safety? Christiana, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so I work for a company called Madhive, which is a blockchain company that is building ad tech solutions um, that really put consumer privacy front and center. Um, and then separately, I run an organization called AdLedger, which is a 501c6 nonprofit. Um, and our focus at AdLedger is building out rules and standards for how we as an industry should apply blockchain technology to our space. Um, and so in terms of our focus on brand safety, I think from the techno technology vendor perspective, our goal is to provide these guys, the, the publishers and agencies and brands, with the tools that they could use to block out things like bot fraud and IBT and all of these problems that we all kind of know are existing in the industry. Okay. Rachel, we know what you do, but what is the very, very top of that, top of that pyramid, the, sort of the, the most burning issue? That, what are you spending most of your time on? Getting companies certified. I mean, we just, we, we, I won't say we can't keep up with the demand, but the demand is incredibly great. We have, gosh, I think our team is taking in anywhere from 10 to 15 new companies a week right now. We are growing gangbusters um, in every possible direction. And the, the moment people are in the door, they are serious about not just being in the tag world, but getting certified. So, you know, it's, it's often a, a conversation of, not slow your horses, but let's understand that there's actually a lot to be done here. We have some companies who come in and are best practice on day one, and it's almost a matter of just looking at the paperwork and signing the form. And then there are others with whom we work very, very closely to bring them up to that best practice, to raise that bar. Um, but you know, always exciting and, and very much inspiring to see the, the excitement that these companies bring to wanting to make sure that they're meeting all of these standards and doing their part. Joe, in your role as, as a managing partner, you're working with all the, all the, all the brands out there. What's your day-to-day? -day? What's your... Uh, sure. We at uh, Group M, we're um, a small company of 36,000, <laughs> and we have seven global brand safety professionals in New York, London, and Singapore. And what we spend our time doing mostly is driving education and adoption of the principles that Rachel was talking about. And a lot of that education is within our own agency teams that don't do this every day. Um, driving the mindset, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. and making sure clients understand the value of protecting their investment, whether it's their financial investment, their reputational investment, or controlling some of the legal risks, again, that Rachel talked about. Um, so that's what we do. A, a lot of um, working with the verification partners, make sure we understand their relative merits and shortcomings, and help them understand what our priorities are, which nowadays tends to focus very much on reputational brand risk in platforms like Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Laurie, what's your day-to-day -day in managing both a consumer <coughs> brand as well as a media brand? Yeah, so in my role, I have a really interesting kind of purview into discovery in that I oversee digital sales and solutions, but a big part of my day-to-day -day is making sure that the digital product that we build is compliant and mm -hmm. compatible to the marketplace and the marketplaces that we play in. So whether it's a direct business or a programmatic business, we have to make sure that the experiences are validated, they're viewable, they're fraud-free, and they're safe in order for me to be able to put our reputation on the line when we're talking to you know, our, our partners uh, and making sure that the advertising is what it promises to deliver. So um, that's what we spend our, times do, uh, our time doing now. We're two months into our marriage. Uh, with the legacy Scripps brands, and so now I'm just trying to wrap my head around what their digital business looks like, um, how we complement each other from a product perspective, and where we have opportunity to drive efficiencies and be take kind of like the best use cases from what they offer and, and what we offer and bringing those together. Yeah. So it's very exciting and very busy all at the same time. So you're all educating the space in your own, you know, client, you could call a client, you know, an internal 
customer or, or external. Um, so Rachel outlined that whole laundry list of, of components of brand safety, but what's your biggest challenge in explaining, you know, through your own lens, what brand safety is? is, is uh, would you say there's an, a, a level of awareness that, that you can start with, or are you really starting at ground zero? Um, I think from, from the technology provider perspective, and especially from a blockchain perspective, I think there's a lot of misinformation about mm -hmm. what blockchain can and cannot do. And I think there's a camp of people that thinks that it will take us to the moon and cure cancer by tomorrow. Um, probably not the case, but I think there is some really serious um, potential that we can unleash if we do it in a really thoughtful way. And we won't be able to do that if we can't explain it in plain English, these really um, very technical concepts. And if we can't get um, a media executive who might not be a software engineer, but who is, mm -hmm. is a really bright, intelligent person to wrap their head around these concepts. We're going to get into that more for, 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 for everybody, kind of what, what that protocol looks like. But um, are you finding a, you know, we're hearing this, these stats about 75% of brands having a brand safety issue. What's the level of understanding when you're walking into a company and explaining this? Well, it, it varies. It varies widely. Um, we, like I said, we have companies who come in the door and are there and ready to go. Right. And, and we have folks who come in and don't know what invalid traffic is, right? Which I think speaks less to that entire company not knowing what's going on. But we see that there are some folks who are very keyed in on this in a company and that can be the only place in that company that there's any awareness around this. So I think that's, that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing at TAG is kind of almost connecting the dots internally such that um, we, we have a system where we've, we require that there's one TAG compliance officer that is the point of contact and has the full picture of what that company is doing with TAG and their, their full compliance. But we strongly <coughs> encourage that person to partner and to raise awareness, as Joe is talking about, in a lot of other different parts of that company so that uh, everything actually can work more smoothly. But, but at the same time, what Christiana is saying very much resonates. We hear, you know, when, when ads.tex came out, and we require it as part of the fraud program, it's important, but we had a lot of folks come to us and say, well, we do ads.tex, so we don't need to get certified. Mm -hmm. Well, that's such a massive misunderstanding of one tiny solution to a much larger problem and much more complicated to solve. So I think education, um, particularly on the buy side in a lot of ways, just about sort of the role that everybody in this supply chain needs to play, uh, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. Joe and Lori, I want to talk about kind of that deal. You guys are in the deal making every day, you know, buying and selling transactional process. Um, for folks who aren't familiar with, with media, there's something called terms and conditions. And that's basically setting out the understanding between a buyer and a seller. And I, at IAB, I've spent a lot of time in <laughs> terms and conditions lately. But the interesting thing is we just had the long form video uh, rewrite of, of, of terms and conditions. and Brand safety, uh, we talked about it a bit, and what we ended up agreeing on was that it was such a big issue that basically all people would, 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 could agree to putting in, the, in the, uh, the template contract was that when it comes to managing brand safety, it's a continuous conversation. So it's kind of like this. this Thanks for that vagueness. Yeah, well, vague, vague, but actually because you can't. We started to say, well, what solutions and, and this and that. But, but so I wanted to ask you, Joe, is, is are, are T's and C's and the insertion order actually starting to address brand safety and expectations of brands? Well, when we look at our brand safety practice, there's a few pillars, including trading, because a lot of, a lot of the leverage our clients have is voting with their budgets. Right. Um, there's technology, which is the verification providers we work with. But terms and conditions really underpin all of it. Because if we don't agree up front, it's not fair for us to go to a publisher and say, we want 20% of our money back because we were measuring something we didn't tell you we were measuring. It yeah. doesn't make any sense. So the terms and conditions are the agreement up front that say these are the things that we're willing to pay for and these are the things that don't make sense. And legitimate good partners on both sides of the desk can never argue that nobody should get paid for fraud. Nobody should get paid for non-viewable ads. So we've actually had terms and conditions in place with most major publishers, in some cases, and the lawyers hate this, for up to 10 years. Uh, and we tend to revise those terms through contract addenda because new things happen. Our original terms and conditions, probably with discovery, didn't say anything about fake news because who knew fake news? Fake news wasn't something we cared about. So we've updated our terms. Viewability, as viewability measurement came into play, we updated our terms for that. 
So it certainly is an ongoing process, no, no question. We're actually even seeing it in our pricing. So we have view viewability pricing now. So it's kind of even gone beyond just the terms and conditions, but how we work together and how we are putting you know, our stake in the ground saying, look, we are doing everything that we can to work within this new environment. We are tag certified. We have ads.txt. Um, or at least we're in the process of getting certified. Um, yes. Um, so we are doing everything that we can. We have Moat integrated into connected devices because viewability is such a big, important factor. Now, we're kind of lucky at legacy discovery because we were 99% premium long-form video ecosystem. Um, legacy Scripts does have a display business that we now need to take into account in regards to viewability, and I think that that's going to be kind of a, a focal point that we'll have over the next kind of three to six months is really digging in there. Um, but we are doing everything that we can through terms and conditions, through DNR lists, to make sure that wherever our brand partners want to have an ad appear, that's where it appears. Um, we use uh, Nielsen DAR for audience guarantees as well, so we're validating that the audience that you're buying is actually um, consuming the ad. Yeah. Um, you mentioned display and desktop. This is, for folks who don't live in the media space, they're, if you just think about how you spend your day in media, you wake up in your morning, you've got your cell phone next to your, next to your pillow, you move quickly to work. Now you've got your desktop or your, or your laptop. You go home at night. Now you've got your smart TV, connected TV. Um, there's a tablet probably in the room. So all these different screens are, are kind of illustrating the complexity of managing this stuff across touch points. Um, this is the Streaming Media East Conference. So it, 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 we can't not say the word OTT. Does everyone know what, what uh, OTT, otherwise known as over the top? This is connected TV, the smart TV. So it was kind of interesting. Uh, Lori and I were on a panel, you know, was it a couple months ago, and uh, we're talking about invalid traffic, viewability, et cetera, on this big screen, you know, authenticated environment where you know you can go go to Discovery, you can go to CNN, et cetera. Your platform, your Roku or or Smart TV knows who you are, and yet there was a huge kind of explosion of discussion in that room around, is this a brand, is OTT a naturally brand safe environment? Or do we need to really get more defined about it? So I want to throw it out to the, whoever feels like picking this one up, is, uh, for instance, is viewability one of the pieces of brand safety? Is that an issue in OTT? I would ask Joe, since Group M was kind of leading the charge on viewability. <clears throat> I'd be curious to know, just from a connected, now I know that an agent at your agency, you do consider connected 100% viewable, but you do have clients that still want it measured. Right, that's true, and um, OTT is on the premium end of video inventory, and as we measure premium video inventory in other platforms like JavaScript supported uh, desktop, yeah. premium content that's uh, appointment viewed tends to be very high viewability. So we established for the sake of expedience with trading deals, 100% viewable metric for OTT before we even were able to measure it. Um, because from the legacy standpoint, the type of experience, think about a lean back versus a lean in environment. When you're scrolling through your Facebook feed, a video starts playing and you never saw that video, right? Um, so viewability rates in social media tend to be very low. But when you're about to watch uh, House Hunters International, it's one of my, one of my favorites. Um, you want to see the show, so you'll sit through the, uh, the spot. Same thing actually is true with YouTube. Any pre-roll environment where people are, are anxious to see the content are more, more likely to be viewable. As we get more uh, different opportunities to stream that media, though, we're, we are concerned about things like failure rate. And sometimes non-viewable is at no fault of the content provider. If your train goes into a tunnel and you lose the signal while you're watching on your smartphone, there might be a signal pass that the ad ran, but the ad was never seen. So we do need technologies like Moat to be able to measure in those environments. Even if it's 5% loss of audience, we wouldn't put up with a 5% loss of audience in broadcast. Um, so there's, there's smaller, much smaller adjustments than you would find in the long tail of video inventory, mm -hmm. but they're still valuable. 
The other thing that we didn't address in our terms and conditions uh, epic project was, was data and how data gets used. And, and uh, Christiana at, at Madhive, you're dealing with audience-based selling and data. We, we all saw Mark Zuckerberg get in front of Congress and, and of course at that point Cambridge Analytica had exploded on, on the, uh, on, in the headlines. How do you think about data and, and brand safety? Is, is data usage and control, should that be part of the conversation as well? I think so. Um, I love that Rachel had uh, data protection and consumer privacy as part of her brand safety slide as, as pieces that um, you know, are, are important. Um, but I think at, at Madhive, because we kind of come from the lens of consumer privacy, um, knowing that, especially given this, this latest news cycle with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, um, knowing that consumers are now much more aware of just how pervasive data collection is, yeah. um, I think it's going to put an onus on us as an industry to give them better control over how that data is used and where and how it's traveling and where it's changing hands. Um, GDPR is going to put a lot of downward pressure um, on us as an industry to do that, but um, I think in general, uh, brand safety is like the, the business of minimizing risk. And if you as a brand are putting your message alongside something in an environment where a consumer has not um, you know, given explicit and affirmative consent, um, it's probably not the best perception of your brand. Okay. I, I, don't, I, I agree entirely with what Christiana said. I mean, again, my background is in privacy and data first and has yep. moved into the criminal aspects. But um, I, you know, I think it, it is, there's a very interesting interplay between what consumers feel about data usage and what they feel about the actual content and experience of the ad. Um, so I think you know we, we, we look at ad blockers and things like that and we think they're concerned about privacy and I think that's not actually what's going on. I think they're annoyed about it's a, a terrible experience, right, of the, of the ad or, or whatever else. Um, or you know, not able to get to the content or the content's covered or whatever else. So I think that's what's interesting about brand safety to me is you can't do any of these in vacuums. I could not agree more that data protection and privacy and data security are incredibly important to, to consumers, but I also think that if we are engaging them in the, in the way that they want to begin with, that is a means of trust building around everything else as well. And I think that makes data protection um, and, and dealing with those kinds of situations a lot easier uh, if, if the consumer is actually happy with the way they're able to engage with you in the first place. So it's a very dynamic relationship in my mind. I love that, that it's moving this experience from this covert thing out into the open and making advertising right. something that is overt in the, the environment that the consumer mm -hmm. is in. Mm -hmm. So fake news is now a huge part of the brand safety <coughs> universe. Um, how many folks here, when you see a news article, feel like you know this is, could be authentic, trusted source or not? Have you ever been faked by fake news? Yes? Yeah. So how do you guys, so I want to talk about this for a minute because it's increasingly, it is a, uh, in a sense, it's really tapped into the zeitgeist of media. You know, in the past election, you had uh, stories like Pope Francis <coughs> endorsing Donald Trump for president. Now we all know that that was a constructed story. And, and of course, the result was, uh, you know, a t million, millions upon millions of views for that, and then a redacted story that explained that this was a con this was a made-up uh, piece of news. We had a discussion about this with with Washington Post's uh, uh, head of ad ops a couple couple days ago, and uh, I asked him, "How do you define fake news?" And he said, "It's." It's essentially news that's created with the intent of misleading consumers for purposes of an agenda or profit. Um, the problem now exists in the marketplace where people call good reported content fake news because they don't like it. So it's really a kind of interesting moment, but there is, the, there is truth and there is fact, and this is, you know, this is the core of, of, of our understanding of, of, uh, of what is journalistic and reported versus what's constructed. So I wanna ask, ask folks on this panel, like, what is your sense? You know, Lori, you are, you represent a brand that's both fun, but you're also talking about, you know, it's, it's documentary in yeah. many ways. So um, when it comes to fake news, I, I'm lucky in that Discovery owns 100% of the content that we produce and distribute under our owned and operated name and right. brand. So it's, it's in the environments and the platforms where there's mostly user generated kind of content and or the ability to free speech 
and free distribute and free publish. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where you get into the concerns, really, from a fake news perspective. I just heard that um, Google just came out with their Q4 report as they are being much more transparent. Um, and they said that in Q4 alone, over 8 mil, 8.3 million videos were immediate, were pulled down yeah. for, you know, for being flagged. But in regards to spam and misleading videos, over 9 million were human flagged yeah. in just Q4 alone. So I think, unfortunately, regular people, when given a platform, are going to take advantage of it, and I think that that causes us as a media landscape and a media community to take pause and think. Sometimes is scale worth the the, mm. the security of my brand reputation? Because we're all looking for scale, and it's these platforms of Facebook and Google that have the scale because it's open. It's an open marketplace right. for publishing. But is it worth it? It's very efficient, right? It's a it's a continuous risk ward. You can you can press a button and you're distributed to millions upon millions. But if it's UGC, you got people commenting on whatever. Even a diapers, you know, a, a baby. In, it's extraordinary what people will will troll. But Joe, <laughs> this kind of raises an interesting question, you know, in my mind. Um, should brands potentially receive a make good if they're appearing adjacent to fake news? Brands should receive a make good for all the time, for everything. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's that my, was a setup. That's wasn't my not? job. You know, it's interesting that you say that, Eric, because uh, when you think about fake news, and, and Laurie was talking about the Google platform, um, there's a difference between community guidelines and advertising-friendly guidelines. Mm -hmm. And one of the scary things about fake news is that if you talk to academics or journalists, they could care less about brands. Journalists don't care about L'Oreal's brand safety. They care about the consumer trust in media. Uh, and of course, they care about their own business models. And if you're the New York Times or the Washington Post or, or Discovery Communications, you might be above fake news concerns because there's so much credibility and awareness of your brand. But if you're a mid-sized newspaper or a small newspaper, you're, being, you know, you're awash in a morass of content that is devaluing the content that you provide. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to deny the revenue to those purveyors so that we can clean up that, that supply. But also, we have to make sure we educate consumers because you said you've probably been a, I mean, we all have. We've all seen things that we said, wow. Um, but what Facebook is starting to do now is when they get signals that they believe that a story is fake, if you try to share it, you'll get a pop-up. And this is still in beta, so some of you may have seen this, but many of you may have not. A pop-up that says, you know, you might not want to share this because we pretty much think it's not true. And the important thing is for them to have enough confidence in the fact that it's not true to not even have it on the platform right, to start to with. Um, but right. but the, uh, the digital literacy issue is a big one. And again, when you talk to academia, they're not really worried about the digital literacy in the United States or Canada or Germany because we're fairly literate in the space. Uh, and even we get fooled sometimes. When you think about the developing world um, and political elections in the developing world, it's much more powerful uh, and the most dangerous fake news purveyors are the ones that aren't in the business to make money. Right. You know, the easy ones are the miracle cures, because we know they're just trying to get, it's just clickbait. Um, but the scary ones are the ones like Russia today or, or North, North Korea today, where if they don't make a dime, they don't care because they have a political agenda. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of expand the conversation into solutions and, and what we are seeing on the horizon. There's a lot of great work being done. There's some everyday uh, black and white simple solutions, ad.tex, ads.cert, you know, certification, tag certification. But when you look out into the brand safety space, what are the solutions that appear promising? So Christiana is, is, is uh, her work with Madhive and AdLedger. Can you, you kind of share, share for a minute, like what does, how does blockchain, how does that distributed ledger unchange, explain blockchain first, <laughs> and then let's unpack, what does this change, you know, and how, how does this, uh, change the game in, in, a, in a marketplace that tends to be pretty murky when you add layer upon layer upon layer of transaction players? Sure. Um, I mean, I think we all know the kind of textbook Wikipedia definition of blockchain, which is the distributed ledger um, that we all can have visibility into and provides a little bit more data security. Um, but I think what is not talked about enough is just how um, 
nascent this industry still is. There's still so much that we need to figure out and need to kind of explore. Um, but I think the immediate places that blockchain will make an impact will be within existing ecosystems like OpenRTB, for example. Um, so something we're doing within AdLedger is using a blockchain-based infrastructure to run a media campaign and discovering what does that look like? What do we gain from this? What do we not gain from it? So what we think we'll gain from it in the immediate term will be improved reconciliation. Um, so for those of you that are in the media space, you know how many disparate sources of data there are when you're trying to run a media campaign. You have the buy and sell side ad server, you have buy and sell side third party verification, you have the DSP numbers and SSP numbers. But if we use blockchain to create an ecosystem um, through which we need to agree or in blockchain reach consensus, it's called, um, on what an impression actually is and what it actually occurs, um, that would be a pretty big win in the immediate term. Um, a second big win is going to be illuminating what we've all kind of referenced as a really long and murky supply chain. Um, but what I think will be even more interesting applications of the technology will be the ones that use it for what it truly is, which is just infrastructure, and use it to build something on top of it that is a, a newer uh, business model that we haven't seen yet. So we just saw uh, today in the news, um, Facebook is doing a reorg and they're aligning their entirely new leadership structure against blockchain and against AI. And so AI, Joe, as you were kind of mentioning, you know, platforms should be able to scan content ideally before it actually gets posted. What do you guys see, anyone, what do you see as, as some kind of promising technologies? Video, you can scan text pretty easily, but video is its own beast. What do you see happening? You know, starting with you, Joe. Well, from a brand, brand safety perspective, they, they are very early stage solutions that are AI driven. The partners that we work with uh, use machine learning, which is sort of a baby version of AI, I guess, best way to put it. Um, but there are some dedicated uh, services, most of which are in the detection for matching or targeting business, and they're trying to flip the model to brand safety. Um, they don't have integrations with the platforms we work with. They don't have a tag-based solution. So what we're anticipating to happen is some consolidation with some of the major third-party verification companies with some of the newer startup technologies to improve the capabilities of the companies we have. Um, it's, it's disruptive because there is so much development. Uh, it's disruptive to, to try to move your business. We already have a deal with Discovery that says we'll trade on moat numbers. So if we say we're going to come up with this company nobody's ever heard of, Acme AI Verification Solution Incorporated, now you have to test it, you have to determine that it works, you have to integrate it into your platforms. But if Moat integrates that technology, it's a lot easier to use it in our business. So I would anticipate that there would be some consolidation with the newer uh, technology with the existing providers. Good. We've got just a couple of minutes. Um, I'm just show of hands, who here has questions about blockchain? <laughs> so let's, let's, the dialogue is always best. I always want to go to the, to the conversation. What, what would you, I mean, you've, we've got a brain trust here. What, what's, what, what, what would you like to know about kind of brand safety at this point? Coming from Israel, I know this is, uh, you guys are pretty good at security. How do you guys think about this space? Sure. Um, I think in terms of, of brand safety, just being able to have a blockchain-backed data chain of custody and even to be able to see how the supply chain is working and illuminate that murkiness will be a boon to brand safety in the short term. But I think in the longer term, um, newer business models that will evolve will be able to make it either impossible or financially infeasible to execute fraud. So for example, at Mount Hive, we're doing research on a principle called traceable ring signatures. And essentially what that means is if you as a consumer are trying to watch the same or uh, two different ads on the same device at the same time, it will automatically detect that and not enable it. So a fraud scheme like Methbot would become impossible or financially infeasible because you would need a warehouse full of devices to be able to execute that. 
Um, so I think there is no perfect answer for your question. Can you question draw that? Yet. Just go up to the board. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think as an industry, that's that's something that we're still kind of hacking on, and the solution isn't there yet, but down, Teresa, we're working on it. Truth, I'm going to use that. Right. I, I actually am looking forward to it, if you think of the programmatic marketplace yep. and, and the revenue loss and the technology tax Disappearing out piece dollars. of that supply chain. There are so much, there's a lot of dollars lost between the bid and the actual uh, delivery of an impression. And so I think the more transparent we can be within that supply chain, I think one that's also going to benefit our, our brand partners in the end, making more of their dollars working uh, and understanding who all's getting a piece and where and how and why. More of our ad dollars, yeah. making more transparency. This is all, all great stuff. I think we're actually at time. We have probably quite room for one more question. Anybody else? All right. With that, I think we have a wrap. And thank you so much, everybody, for, for your participation. To Rachel, to Christiana, to Joe, and Lori. Thanks. Thank you.